Good morning. This is Edward Mazur, Chairman of the City Club of Chicago. I want to welcome you to our program today. The City Club of Chicago was founded in 1903. We are the oldest public affairs organization in the city of Chicago and the state of Illinois. We're so very glad that you could join with us this morning for a very special program. I want to thank the sponsors of today's program, Hush Blackwell LLP, Deloitte, and the University of Illinois Systems. Our speaker today is President Timothy Colleen of the University of Illinois System. With universities in Urbana-Champaign, Chicago, and Springfield, Illinois. Since taking office in 2015, President Colleen has helped lead a surge of growth across the state's flagship university system. Enrollment at the various campuses are at record highs, including increases among in-state and underrepresented students. Student costs have been held in check by affordability initiatives that include a five-year tuition freeze for Illinois students and substantial increases in institutional financial aid. Retention, graduation rates, top national norms, while student debt rates are lower. A unique hiring initiative will add up to 45 renowned professors to the system's already world-class faculty ranks. And another seeks to add nearly 500 new tenure system faculty. A capital program will build or upgrade nearly 350 facilities over the next decade to ensure classroom and research space matches the system's academic excellence. And the system's largest fundraising campaign is ahead of pace toward its $3.1 billion goal. President Colleen is a leading researcher in geophysics and space sciences. He has championed efforts to expand the research discovery that drives progress and job creation. This includes helping lead creation of two pioneering new initiatives that I'm sure he will talk to us about. The Discovery Partners Institute, or DPI, a world-class research center in downtown Chicago, and the Illinois Innovation Network, a system of satellite research hubs that will help spread its impact across the state. President Colleen has also reaffirmed the system's commitment to the arts and humanities, launching a program that has pumped nearly $2 million into faculty initiatives that underscore their importance to a well-rounded education. When he joined the U of I system in 2015, President Colleen brought more than three decades of experience as an educator, researcher, and administrator in public higher education and in leadership positions with national scientific research agencies. President Colleen has authored more than 150 publications in peer-reviewed journals, along with more than 300 other publications and papers. He's a native of Wales and a U.S. citizen. President Colleen received his bachelor's degree in physics and astronomy at University College in London, where he also earned his doctorate degree in atomic and molecular physics and was later awarded an honorary doctor degree. His wife, Roberta M. Johnson, is a distinguished scholar in her own right, holding bachelor's, master's, and PhDs in geophysics from the University of California at Los Angeles. The Colleens have three children. President Colleen, we're delighted to have you with us today, and we look forward to hearing your remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ed, and uh, good morning to everyone. Um, it's just a pleasure to connect with all of you today. And I'm, I'm proud of the key role that the University of Illinois system played in making this event happen, because in case you didn't know, we pioneered the very first internet chat rooms, the forerunners of the virtual forums like this that have been kind of our lifeline to continue work uh, to family and friends and connect with our communities 
since this global pandemic turned our world upside down last spring. I'm going to talk about optimism with the University of Illinois system in a sh shameless mode, and I hope you bear with me. But first, I'd like to say that COVID-19 has handed us all challenges and worries unlike any in our lifetimes. And my deepest personal sympathies and condolences to those of you who have suffered the ultimate loss, a family member or friend among the many Americans who have lost their lives to the virus. We stand with you in support, and like you, we are clinging to the mounting glimmers of optimism that this historic tragedy will soon end. Before I get started, I'd like to introduce several members of our leadership team who are with us for today's event. We have Don Edwards, uh, the chairman of our board of trustees, Michael Amiridis, chancellor of the University of Illinois, Chicago, Robert Jones, chancellor of the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, Karen Whitney, Interim Chancellor of the University of Illinois Springfield, Bob Wilson, Executive Vice President for the U of I system, Jay Walsh, Interim Vice President for Economic Development and Innovation, Avijit Ghosh, Vice President and Chief Financial Officer and Controller, Jim Moore, President of the University of Illinois Foundation, and Jennifer Dillavu, President of the University of Illinois Alumni Association. The people of Illinois are fortunate to have such engaged and supportive trustees and such dedicated and passionate university leaders guiding the future of their state's flagship university system. And our future in the university system and the states are intertwined fundamentally. Our three best-in-class universities are pipelines for the next generation talent and the breakthrough innovation that drives progress and prosperity right here at home the fuel that will move Illinois forward. Uh, so I'd like to begin today with a premiere of a short vi video that captures our impact, framed around contributions to the fight against COVID that have showcased that power and our value in real time. So if we could look at the video, please. Unprecedented. We're hearing that word a lot these days. But unprecedented doesn't mean impossible. And uncertainty just calls for chasing the truth harder. When you're in uncharted territory, someone has to make a map. So the times are trying. Doesn't that mean we should be trying to improve the world now more than ever? There's a common attitude throughout our health enterprise, at our three universities, and across the state of Illinois. The will to turn uncertain times into certain progress. After all, it's what we were made to do. Here's how we're doing it across the entire University of Illinois system. We provide care for the most vulnerable and save lives. Graduate some heroes early so they can help on the front lines faster. Model, analyze, and extrapolate the data so that you can show leaders the future every single day. Create more tests and initiate clinical trials faster. Make sure learning is protected at all costs bring together the best and brightest to innovate for solutions we need most, and count on our community to support our efforts, now more than ever. This is bigger than three universities, bigger than one system or a single state. At a defining moment of our time, hundreds of thousands across the University of Illinois system are taking the lead against a pandemic that affects each of us, billions around the world. So it's going to take all of us, together, to turn uncertain into extraordinary. There's a good chance you've heard of it. It's been featured this fall in national media outlets from CBS to CNN to the Washington Post and the New York Times hailed as a national model by Fortune magazine, and our success is being leveraged by the prestigious National Institutes of Health in its efforts to improve testing nationwide. But it emerged from the same cloud of uncertainty that engulfed all of us last March. The novel coronavirus was brand new then, and, and about all anyone knew for sure is it was, it, it was dangerous, dangerous enough that we quickly sent our nearly 90,000 students home to study and most of our 25,000 faculty and staff home to work. We also knew that we wanted to bring them back and bring them back safely. 
a seemingly simple goal that would put our creativity over the spring and summer to the ultimate test, since the virus was still a mystery and there were no options on the shelf to really pick from. So our brilliant researchers in Urbana-Champaign pounced, going to work from morning to dark through the spring into the summer, no holiday breaks, 7 a.m. meetings, driven by hopes of developing a safe and traditional fall semester. Their work produced a comprehensive ecosystem that was born through pioneering innovation and fine-tuned through lessons learned and that has held COVID in check on our campuses as most of the nation wrestled with outbreaks. Their work produced a comprehensive ecosystem that was born through that innovation uh, and we're very proud of it. Before students left for winter break last month, as COVID's second wave pushed Illinois' positivity rate into double digits and forged new restrictions, our three universities bucked the trends. Rates were under 2% across the system, and today the positivity rate in Urbana-Champaign is 0.43%, um, vastly less than adjacent counties even. So it's a safe place to study, and it's been because of the success of this ecosystem. So how did it happen, and what made our campuses islands of safety amid COVID's rising tide? The credit goes to a homegrown program that our researchers named SHIELD, a name pinned to their goal of shielding our campus communities from the virus. And it features saliva-based tests pioneered by our researchers, tests that are far less expensive than swabs, which, and then which allow for more widespread um, affordable testing. Our tests also produce much quicker results with a turnaround of hours and not days, so we can stop COVID transmission in its tracks. A companion phone app, homegrown again, logs test results, regulates access to buildings to safeguard classrooms, offices and residence halls, and limits spread even further by alerting users if they have been exposed to other users who have the virus, all used digitally. And I can't tell you how much reassurance that gives to both students, professors, and the families of our students to know that their, their uh, loved ones have been tested and are safe. That groundbreaking technology is the centerpiece of a complex ecosystem that was built up just in a few short months, including logistics at quite a scale, buying testing materials, setting up labs, sites, staffing them, supply chain issues, and much, much more. With a full semester now under our belt, here's what we've learned. Shield works because it lets us see the whole iceberg and not just the tip of the iceberg. We test everybody. Frequent widespread testing, like Urbana's twice a week test for all students, mitigates COVID spread because it keeps tabs on everyone and doesn't give COVID the time to propagate. And that happens whether individuals have symptoms or not. And that we have found many asymptomatic carriers of the disease. These fast results allow us to quarantine people comfortably and safely, but early if they have infections, including people, as I said, who are asymptomatic and would otherwise unknowingly spread the uh, virus. Our SHIELD protocol has taught us that minutes count, and getting people into quarantine sooner means fewer people are exposed to keep the circle of infection growing. And that's an important lesson we've learned, so intervention is critical. We've also learned that blanket testing is our proverbial canary in the coal mine, helping us spot COVID quickly, crush it, and then leave it nowhere to hide. We have done more than a million tests already. And when students were on campus, uh, 10 to 15,000 daily tests accounted for about 1% of the daily total for the entire nation of the United States. So we're doing a lot of these. Casting that wide net enabled us to spot flare-ups and act before they became outbreaks keeping our positivity rates down. No hospitalizations or any deaths in our student body. It tipped us off to the early semester student parties in Urbana, as well as an uptick in cases among faculty and staff that alerted to us that the virus was coming to campus from the external community, rather than going from the campus to the external community. 
But we have also learned that testing alone cannot contain COVID. It has to be part of a holistic approach that includes tried and true safety measures that make masks, hand washing and social distancing all important and the computational risk analysis that we also uh, have pioneered. And our experience have proved that community engagement is key, a buy-in, an understanding of the goal and the stakes, and a shared sense of purpose, a pride and ownership of our overall approach. That has required transparency and outreach, and, and that's been extended to every stakeholder, students, faculty and staff, university leadership, and our partners in the communities that we call home. The response has been remarkable. Thousands of our students signed a voluntary pledge to watch out for their own health and for each other. Tens of thousands downloaded the com computational app and you could just feel a sense of pride welling up across our campus communities as Shield's fame grew and its success made headlines from coast to coast. Pride rooted in the fact that they actually, the students, made it, made it happen. And I suspect that they are as proud as I am of our efforts to expand Shield's reach beyond our campuses and meet a surge of demand that has continued to grow since the testing and surveillance program was launched. As you all know, last month we reached an agreement that will take the testing to University of Wisconsin-Madison, which will ramp up to 10,000 tests a day next spring. Within the next weeks, we hope to provide testing for essential and frontline workers in the cities of Champaign and Urbana and many more agreements to share our testing are in the works with other public universities across our state and beyond. We're currently in talks with well over 30 universities, including all the public universities in Illinois, as well as dozens of K-12 schools, corporations, units of government, and nonprofits. And recently we made presentations to interested groups from right here in Illinois to the United Kingdom, uh, to New Zealand, to the Philippines, and beyond internationally. And Urbana's Granger College of Engineering has completed the prototype of a lab on wheels that does 10,000 tests per day of these non-invasive, low-cost, rapid turnaround saliva tests. We call it Mobile Shield that will allow us to take testing to where it's needed. And all of these initiatives are reflective of our land-grant commitment that we've carried since our founding to help create the future, to steer through challenges that stand in the way and lead the way to progress. Over our more than 150 year history, the University of Illinois system has helped the agrarian society of our founding move into the manufacturing revolution, into today's digital age, and now dealing with the COVID challenge. And we've done it in partnership with the state and with the communities that we call home. And I'm deeply grateful to Governor Pritzker, and Mayor Lightfoot, and others for their confidence and support. Now we're poised to help lead the way again through these troubled times. The challenges we're facing are historic. The worst healthcare crisis in a century, economic slide, um, the racial reckoning that has again shined a spotlight on social equity and justice that we must achieve together. But we can help restore health, safety, and the way of life that we appreciate more than ever. And we can lead an economic revival like the ones universities created in uh, Silicon Valley and Boston, but ours will go one better with a bedrock focus on not just prosperity and wealth development, but on social equity and lifting communities, lifting the have nots and making sure that nobody is left behind. Our success has been guided by a strategic framework approved by our board of trustees in 2015 after it was developed through a thorough inclusive process and, ca and capitalized on the insights and expertise of our many stakeholders. And so I want to just give you a little uh, overview of how this strategic framework is working. It's been our North Star ever since, our call to excellence based on the four pillars that reflect everything we're determined to be. The first pillar focuses on our most fundamental mission, our students to be an institution of and for our students, to open our doors wider, to ensure student success and excellence in our educational mission. Since then, since we launched the strategic framework, system-wide enrollment has followed the plan. It surged by more than 12%, from 80,000 in the fall of 2015 to more than 90,000 this fall, which is a record enrollment for the eighth straight year even amid 
the historic challenges we faced this year due to COVID and the previous budget impasse. And it includes ongoing increases that promote equity. And we never stop working to serve the students of Illinois, to open doors of opportunity for underrepresented students and to change the trajectory of entire families by welcoming more first-generation students. Join us at commencements and you will see what I'm talking about. In the five years since our strategic framework was adopted, I'm very proud to say that underrepresented students across the system have increased from 25% of all undergraduates in 2015 to 32% of all undergraduates this fall. Every percent hard fought, hard won, and there's more to do on that front. Our ongoing enrollment gains are rooted in extraordinary academic programs that attract the best and brightest students from around the world. In the latest US News and World Report rankings, Urbana-Champaign ranked as the 15th best public university in the nation, and UIC jumped eight spots up to 52nd, putting two of the nation's very best publics under the umbrella of the U of I system. And UIS, again, ranked as the best regional public university in Illinois and among the best in the Midwest. So we're all about enrollment growth and excellent. Our enrollment growth is also supported by a historic commitment to affordability, which has included, as you've heard, a five-year in-state tuition freeze that was the longest in half a century, and an in-house commitment that has doubled institutional financial aid to more than $240 million in the last decade. We don't want our students to be left behind and lose opportunities because of financial hurdles. So scholarships, as well as academics, research, and bricks and mortar are enjoying support as well from our many stakeholders, from record fundraising by the University of Illinois Foundation. This year, for the first time in the Foundation's 85-year history, both cash and new business totals each exceeded more than $400 million in a single fiscal year. Our stakeholders are voting with their feet and with their generosity to support our university system. In addition, we are now collectively at 91% towards our world high number of $3.1 billion in the most ambitious capital program ever. And we have nearly two more years to go before the campus-based campaigns close in 2022. So I appeal to you all to help us not just break through the finish line, but to continue beyond with the campaign. Along with financial aid, we also invest in student success throughout their time with us, with retention and graduation rates that we watch like hawks that are well ahead of national averages and student debt ratios that are also lower than national averages. Our first year retention rate, for example, is 88% compared with the national average of 81% for four year publics. Our six year graduation rate system wide is 76%, well ahead of the 61% average for publics, and student debt averages significantly less than 25,000, well below the national average of more than $29,000. So we look at the metrics and the numbers, and we watch how they develop over time, and we're committed to affordability, access, completion, and then success in society. In the end, our efforts do pay off in the most important category, which is careers. Our graduates, and I know many of the listeners are graduates, and thank you for your, for your hanging there with us. Our graduates find jobs within months, destination jobs, not just jobs that are uh, with high starting wages. For example, 93% of Urbana graduates and 82% of Chicago graduates land their first destination job or graduate school within six months and nearly 90% of Springfield graduates land theirs within a year. Starting salaries are good. They top 63,000 in Urbana and 54,000 in Chicago and 45,000 in Springfield. And most of our graduates, by far the majority, stay in Illinois to work and live, raise families and have careers. The second of our framework's four pillars calls on us to think big and to use our power as a research grant giant to solve the world's best challenges. Um, our legacy was already rich, including air conditioning, LED, MRI, night vision technology, the Shinglex breakthrough shingles vaccine, HIV therapies, a host of innovations that enabled the digital age, including 
as you know, the first graphical internet browser. And we've built on that legacy during the pandemic in the recent months, from our Shield ecosystem to clinical trials at UIC for all of the, most of the uh, really well-known um, uh, leading vaccines uh, to control the virus. So we've been working on these vaccines uh, for months with clinical trials and are very excited to see the progress. And now we're working also um, with other stakeholders on the distribution of successful vaccines. This kind of legacy makes us a place where the world turns to solve its greatest challenges. Why not Illinois? Why not us? Why not now? And has attracted and does attract more than $1 billion in funding. That's the number this year uh, for sponsored projects. And that ranks 15th among universities nationwide. And those are dollars that come to Illinois that, that could have easily gone elsewhere. So we're funding the breakthroughs of tomorrow, such as the pioneering work of researchers um, in a banner that's engineered a shortcut around a glitch in photosynthesis to improve agricultural productivity, which could make crops 40% more productive and provide the food that's critical to sustain our ever-growing world. And this fall, which I'm particularly excited about, we also partnered with uh, the prestigious University of Toronto to lead a binational consortium created by the Council for the Great Lakes region. This is regional leadership. And the consortium will capitalize on a network of world-class teaching and research universities that are such a strength of our region. Together, they'll facilitate cross-border collaborations and work with companies and government to promote sustainability and create a pipeline of talent and innovation and ensure the region's long-term competitiveness at scale. We succeed through research, bold thinking that spans discipline, disciplines and campuses, and we're noted for our ability to seamlessly cross disciplinary space and includes partnerships with many of the very best universities around the world. Universities in about 60 countries, we have uh, deep relations and deepening relations with, as you'll see, with Discovery Partners Institute. And our discovery doesn't gather dust on the shelf only. Uh, it does get into archival journals, but we put it to work for the public good. More than 300 startups have grown from our research and our research accomplishments land the U of I system in the top 25 of Reuters' latest rankings of the world's most innovative universities. We're in the top 25 in the world for innovation. Our alumni are also making their marks upon the world. And here are just a few examples of companies that they have founded that are ingrained in our everyday lives. If you add up the, the, the current uh, annual budgets of these companies, you quickly get to above $70 billion. So our impact on the world is also through the accomplishments of our alumni. The framework's third pillar calls on us to ensure a healthy future for our state and for all of the Midwest. And you're seeing how we're working on this. We do it in countless ways, including the $17.5 billion economic impact, annual economic impact, that our operations and our alumni have on the Illinois economy every year. That's bigger than most or many Fortune 50 companies, and it's all right here in our state and in our city. We also do it through the impact of our research and through the pipeline of world-class talent that we produce that sent nearly 800,000 graduates into the global workforce, including more than 450,000 right here in Illinois. And, and most of them in Chicagoland, I might add. And thousands more join them every year, more than 23,000 degrees granted annually, bigger than most universities, yet another new record. And that includes graduates of one of the nation's largest medical schools right here in UIC, a leading producer of the state's medical professionals. UIC trains one out of every three physicians practicing in Illinois. It trains four out of every 10 dentists. We train six in every 10 veterinarians and four in every 10 pharmacists in the state of Illinois. So we're contributing in huge ways to the uh, human capital in the health uh, arena. And a new medical school was launched just a few years ago in Urbana-Champaign, the first in the nation founded at the intersection of medicine and engineering, a school that will help lead the way in producing next generation doctors, equipment, and procedures. Across all areas of study, we are making sure our students learn from the best. 
A $60 million presidential initiative that Ed mentioned has added 24 new staff faculty in the last three years, globally regarded scholars in a host of crucial fields from engineering and medicine to public finance and history. And they come to us from Duke and Harvard and uh, Texas A&M and Washington University major institutions. The new cohort of 10 that we just announced will bring with them more than $21 million in current research support and activities. We also are ensuring that our facilities match our world-class faculty through an initiative that will invest $4 billion in nearly 350 construction and renovation projects across the system over a decade. Projects totaling 700 million have already been completed in the three years since this initiative began. Classrooms, labs, residence and dining halls and athletic facilities and another $1.5 billion in projects are currently underway. Our value to the state and the nation has perhaps never been more evident than during the COVID-19 pandemic. As I mentioned earlier, we have displayed our land grant power in real time. Along with our SHIELD ecosystem, our contributions include engineering an emergency ventilator in a matter of days, now in use in India, providing leading edge epidemiological modeling that guided Illinois stay at home orders and hosted leading edge clinical trials for vaccines and therapies such as the Moderna, uh, uh, Prezista and Johnson and Johnson trials. Moderna producing a vaccine judged 95% effective now awaiting FDA approval. Our final pillar seeks to make our universities the model for higher education in the 21st century, and I mean capital T, the model. The best of the best in everything that we do. In particular, it challenged us to expand our land-grant mission into the 21st century, to take on this generation's unique problems and foster the solutions that create jobs and prosperity, leaving no one behind. We have already met the challenge through our Discovery Partners Institute and the Illinois Innovation Network. Together, they will supply the next generation workforce and innovation that drives progress by bringing everybody to the table. The very best researchers, industry, and its real world needs, investors, entrepreneurs, and leaders of governments and nonprofits. And as you can see, we have already been joined by extraordinary partners from literally around the world. DPI and IIN are already real and growing fast, supported by $500 million in capital funding from the state that will help build DPI's permanent headquarters in downtown Chicago along the river and IIN sites at every public university in Illinois, including all three of ours. A Boston consulting group analysis says it is a formula for success. It projects, BCG projects, that over the next decade, this enterprise will pump $19 billion into the Illinois economy and create 48,000 new economy jobs, many of them for underrepresented minorities. The achievements we have reached by stretching for the high goals of our strategic framework have shown us yet again that the University of Illinois system is a place where anything is possible, where we turn uncertainty into extraordinary. And it is a place where everything we do traces back to our students. They are job one, our top priority. And our commitment to them goes far beyond just teaching the skills to fuel their careers. We are equally committed to nurturing them as people with the awareness, understanding, and insight to shape the future that we want to see. We are determined to instill the civic spirit and compassion for their neighbors that will help them lead in their communities to instill respect for the First Amendment and to the rights and opinions of others, to instill a passion for healthy, appropriate debate and to getting the facts, not rushing to judgment. We want integrity to define them, rooted in honesty and strong moral character. We want them to be forthright, hardworking and transparent. We want them to be grounded, to never cut corners and always share credit. We want them to be dedicated and loyal thoughtful and respectful, and determined to make people proud even when no one is watching. We want them, in short, to take the high road, always the high road. 
It is the road towards the future that our scholarship and innovation are building and towards the brighter tomorrow that we all imagine. Even these historically dark times will ultimately be relegated to history. I warned you that my talk would be bragging shamelessly about the university and I didn't lie. But these dark times will go and we will emerge stronger and great research universities like the U of I system will play a key role, solving problems and driving progress that has been in our DNA from the very beginning, since our founding over a century and a half ago through a stroke of President Abraham Lincoln's pen. So we are engines of the optimism that we also desperately need now, me among you. And we are determined to help steer past today's challenges and drive new waves of progress, just as we have so many times in the past. My thanks once again to all of you for your time, your support, and your commitment to this great city. Thank you. Very good. Uh, President Colleen, we have a number of questions from our uh, listeners and viewers. Um, is it okay if we please do try to answer some of those? Very good. Um, this is from Stephen Papa George, who I have a feeling may be a recent graduate of one of the University of Illinois campuses. His comment and question is, 2020 graduates have encountered significant difficulties because of the pandemic. Is the university system doing anything out of the ordinary to support these students given that their norm was turned upside down. For example, enhanced career services, invitation to future commencements. Yes, uh, we're, we're very concerned about that. And it's not just the recent graduates, it's the K through 12 students, it's the incoming freshmen, it's our students who are you know, feeling isolated and uh, maybe don't have the technologies to hand that they need. So there is stress throughout our entire system, no question about that. So we're, we're working hard on all of those things, on uh, job career uh, boosting, on counselors to deal with mental health issues for our students, to find uh, new ways of safe socialization so people can keep in, in touch with one another, to enable them to um, uh, remain connected, uh, and, and we're looking hard at the issues of next generation jobs and how we can do a better job uh, um, with more coherent ways to connect our alums so that they feel connected in a lifelong way to their university. Now, overnight, um, it's not all going to you know, dissipate all of these issues, but we're working very hard on, on all of that. We recognize, as I pointed out, and I hope you heard, that our students and their future success in society are why we exist. So these are the problem sets we're, we're talking through. Right now, we're, we're having um, uh, summits on mental health issues. We're looking at what other universities are doing. We're starting to, to um, try to define what a post-pandemic higher education system looks like on all of these fronts it's going to we know it's going to be more technologically driven it's going to involve more technology and, and distance and hybrid education and there's going to be more connectivity in post-graduation settings as well so it's a it's a question full of insight there's no simple you know bullet answer but we're on it i can assure you of that thank you very much and i know that uh, several weeks ago uh, we did a program in which um the dean of the uh, School of Public Health up here in Chicago at UIC was on, and he talked about the dramatic interest in public health issues, epidemiology, and research going on. So when you said that the coronavirus has been a challenge and an opportunity, that certainly reflects on the comments of the dean of the School of Public Health. Yeah. We're learning such a lot about um, human health, uh, the propagation of illnesses, diseases, our state of readiness, what it means for societal function. Um, we're, we're learning a lot because of our um, ecosystem called SHIELD that I hope you did hear about that, that is large and comprehensive and covers everybody. 
we're, we're learning a lot about public health. We're being contacted right now by um, the vaccine leadership in, the, in our country to talk through how to deploy vaccines. We're working on, the, um, on all the issues of uh, trust, confidence, messaging, uptake, uh, you know, in terms of how to propagate uh, effective um, health uh, uh, procedures into populations. We're looking at the differences between a inner city porous neighborhood and a campus and a rural setting. Um, we're learning a lot about, um, so the, the, the COVID crisis is opening our eyes to what can be done. And we think we need to meet these things energetically um, for the optimal public good through saving lives. And we think we're on that path um, and we're seeing uptake with other universities, other countries, as I mentioned. Um, also the transition team is contacting us about how to do this um, next year of COVID cover um, uh, effectively. I would say public health is, is really in the spotlight and we've got a wonderful public health institute uh, both in Havana Champaign and in notably in, in UIC, where the dean there spent many years at uh, CDC. Um, and we're, we're not only learning, you know, but we're also implementing solutions and, and understanding. We're looking after the homeless under bridges in Chicago, for example, and, and vulnerable populations in long-term care health facilities and how often you need to test and what isolation and quarantine really means and how quickly people recover. So all of those lessons, I think, will really benefit society as we move, as we move forward. And so we're, we're embracing the challenge, um, but we're in recognition how hard it is on people. This, these are grueling times and it's, um, we've got to really take stock of that and be a little bit more fault tolerant perhaps with one another so that we recognize it's tiring, it's grueling, but we're all in it together and we're gonna use our intellectual prowess and our wonderful student body to get to the other side in better shape. Thank you very much. Uh, you sort of answered the question from Beth Wolniewicz, sorry for butchering your last name, Beth, from Splunk. And she wanted to uh, hear your comments on the success of the Shield, and I think you've talked a lot about Shield and shared that with us, so we thank you. This is from Bill Forsyth. He wants to know, what is the biggest challenge you face as you look ahead to the next fiscal year? Well, we, we are certainly challenged fiscally. The, the cost of our whole Shield developments and our testing and the loss of revenue is, is giving us a challenging fiscal outlook. But we're doing, we're working on it. We're, we're doing good stewardship, as you might imagine. We're also looking at uh, delaying some things that uh, can be delayed so that we can transfer reserves into operational costs. So there's no question that our fiscal future in the near term is more challenging than none of us, any of us would have wanted or expected. But we will weather this. We weathered the first fiscal year of this effectively. Everything stayed open. Our hospital took care of people. We had enough beds, enough ventilators. So we're, we're weathering this, I think, exceptionally well. And we will come out of this stronger than before. There, there's going to be, I think, a resurgence of belief, confidence, and trust in, in the fact that public higher education is a profit center for the state. It's not a cost center, it's a profit center. So we're gonna make, we're gonna be advocating for federal relief and for, um, but I would say to Bill, yes, our, our, our CFO is working on many scenarios and uh, outlooks, but I'm very confident that with other challenges, other timeframes that have been challenging, we will come through this in flying colors. And the fact that our enrollment has grown and that families are voting with their feet to come to our doors. And we are graduating and we're teaching and we're doing research, pioneering research, I think sets the stage for a growing importance of our essential enterprise. And the value proposition, including things like Discovery Partners Institute and the Illinois Innovation Network, is exactly what the state needs to build up its, its tax base, frankly, which is, uh, and, and so we're gonna do all of the above and we will make you all proud. So yes, challenging, but we're we gonna come through it, absolutely. 
Very good. And Bill, I think that was a very complete answer. Uh, we have two questions here. Well, they're the same question. Chris Smith with Ekinoff Sanders and Elizabeth Ann Duty Gorman with Naresco. How does the university prioritize resources between campuses? Well, we we uh, we've we've got a history of doing that well, um, and uh, we have sort of a historical division that is working well. We're looking at enrollment growth, um, and we're looking at uh, priorities among and between um, colleges and campuses as well. But we've really focused on the synergies and on the collaborations rather than. Um, we are a family, um, and in fact, in my tenure here, it's been, um, there hasn't been, you know, why does my sibling get that much and I get only this much? There's been none of that. We have, we have a team that is working congenially, effectively, well together, and we review very carefully on an annual basis all of our budgetary. We go through annual budget reviews where everything is laid out. We look at FTEs, we look at trends, we look at opportunities, we look at the need for uh, initiatives, and we look for whatever growing needs there might be to cover certain circumstances. And so it's always being adjusted, and if it's in just being adjusted in a transparent way, and we report on all of that, of course, regularly to the state. I'll give you an example of something that's becoming a higher priority, and that's mental health issues. We're now needing to invest more in, in mental health questions of, so that students uh, have opportunities to get help if and when and as they encounter problems along the, and that means more counselors, um, more, more opportunities to connect, more events and so forth. So we're always in adjustment mode, um, in a sort of continuous improvement mode, um, but the priorities are, are um, readily set through looking carefully in a transparent way at what we're doing, how many people we're serving, and the um, uh, issues and problems and opportunities that confront us. Thank you. Um, this is from Michael Del Camp with Northern Illinois Gas Company. What is the university doing regarding reduction of carbon emission goals? Are there energy savings programs that the campuses are pushing? Absolutely, yes. Each of our campuses has a strategic plan, and they're very ambitious strategic plans. We are driving towards being carbon neutral by mid-century, uh, and maybe even bringing that date forward from 2050 to uh, perhaps even a decade or a decade and a half earlier than that. Um, the, the goals and activities include uh, setting up, um, you know, obviously conservation is important, but uh, we have a huge solar farm that we've just opened up, a uh, version two of that in Urbana-Champaign that is going to provide a good percentage of, uh, of the uh, energy needs for Urbana-Champaign. I think the number is about 15%. So we're moving aggressively on all of those fronts, but in, in, in concert with our student body that cares a lot about these things. So that is a priority for us. We want to um, make sure that we have um, attainable sustainability goals that are frankly inspiring to young people because they care about such things, but are grounded in, uh, in, in engineering and physics and chemistry and so forth. We're looking a lot at agricultural uh, activities because we're a, obviously a land grant. We got strengths in agriculture. So they're going to be significant ways to uh, make improvements in the overall uh, decarbonization efforts working in the agricultural setting, as well as transportation, logistics, urban settings. We've got experts working in all of those areas. Well, thank you. Uh, this question here is from Maureen Ramirez, who's with Walsh Construction. How will the University of Illinois be procuring the majority of their work in 2021 and the near future? CBD, P3, single prime, or multiple prime. I hope you're familiar with those terms. I, I am. Because I am. I'm not. I'm very familiar with those terms, and Maureen, it's a it's a great question, and we are working working hard to make sure that we have the the most effective way of procuring 
um, help. We have we have um, uh, symposia to um, to interact with potential uh, offerers. Um, we do that regularly. We we focus a lot, as you might imagine, on underrepresented and female-owned businesses. Um, we follow, of course, the state's laws um, to the you know absolute. So a, a, a procurement has to has to dot all the I's and cross all the T's. But we're also working with the state legislative community to improve those laws that would allow it to be a little bit easier for new businesses to enter the fray, as it were, um, and to have things like, um, uh, you know, the ability to use a Chicago uh, certification downstate and vice versa, those kinds of things. Now, when we get a, a single prime, which we do often, you know, in some of the medical devices, you have to go sole source. Uh, there's only one company that makes, you know, robotic surgical devices and things like that. So we, we look at every every purchase um, for the specific opportunities to make sure that there's the broadest possible um, opportunity family for for offerers. And when there is a prime and it's subprimes, we put the primes on the spot to meet certain goals in terms of... Uh, uh, supplier diversity. Um, so I, I could put you in contact with our experts on procurement, but each university is working hard on on all of that. There will be opportunities that uh, to participate um, that uh, hopefully you know the appropriate companies are looking at and uh, know about. And of course, we've got people who can answer the phone and address questions, all following the procurement rules of the state. Thank you, President Colleen. Uh, we have two more questions here. Uh, the first one is from Gretchen Winter. Could you please talk more about the partnerships and interdisciplinary projects currently underway at DPI? Oh, uh, yes. We've got a, a family of partnerships um, with a number of international universities. We've launched nine um, science teams we have uh, order of magnitude 100, 150 faculty working on these science teams. They're funded seed grants on um, uh, many areas, energy, water, transportation, logistics, artificial intelligence. Um, uh, I would say the computational uh, predictive analytics component of it is, is prevalent uh, based on our you know, strengths in computer science and computational science and the fact we have bandwidth, we have computing and so forth. So that's a, a major component. We're looking at um, uh, a, a deeper partnership with the with, uh, University of Toronto. That's, it's not me, I don't think. Um, we're looking at the University of uh, Toronto with a uh, regional partnership, which will be about uh, water in the Great Lakes. It'll be about biodiversity. It'll be about transportation, uh, logistics, um, artificial intelligence, again, is going to be uh, a signal, uh, significant component of it. DPIIN is an open innovation ecosystem, but the IIN hubs have typically tailored their, 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 their initiatives and their emphasis in an area that makes sense. So, for example, for them, for them regionally. So, for example, University of uh, Illinois, Southern Illinois Carbondale is focused on brewing technology. So there'll be a focus there. Rockford might well be a focus on aerospace because that's regionally tailored to their needs. But there's going to be a connective tissue uh, in terms of data mining, data management, computational uh, underpinnings that will help all of those uh, kinds of systems. In Northern Illinois University, the partnership there is about uh, regional sustainability. Um, so um, we cast a very broad thematic net for the uh, for the areas. So it's not a very highly focused on one thing, um, but it's uh, but it's and that enables, I believe, partners to come in and focus on what's important and relevant and appropriate for them now. And then we find the right kind of faculty to link into that. And that's that's the way it works naturally. So. Um, uh, I won't say almost anything you can think of, but the net is cast very broadly in terms of the intellectual. We also have a commitment to arts and humanities and, and ethics, uh, which is going to be core and central. How do human beings make decision, decisions under risk and uncertainty? That's going to be an important particular 
uh, family of uh, priorities, uh, and um, and uh, we'll be talking to our many partners on uh, on that and developing that in a in a kind of organic way. And I think that's a little bit different from some other innovation systems where it's been sort of highly focused. Yes, we're doing quantum computing. Yes, we're doing um, uh, uh, biodiversity. Yes, we're looking at climate scenarios. Yes, we're looking at at uh, teaching methodologies and. Uh, but it's gonna it's gonna be growing a little bit more organically, naturally, to the to the state we're in, to the system we're in, to the times we're in, and I think that's um, that's appropriate for where we are. Very good, thank you, and thank you for that uh, question, Gretchen. Our final question from Dr. John J. Shannon. He wants to know if you and your administrative team are sort of like magicians. Could you discuss how the University of Illinois, in the midst of our budget challenges in our state, has been able to keep tuition flat while at the same time attracting and retaining top-notch faculty? Well, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting you use the word magic because I've used the word too. Um, you know, I've got a simple equation where we want to optimize impact, right? Impact is what we're all about, whether it's for students or the economy. And impact is a product of excellence and scale. You've got to have excellence and scale, that big impact. But I raise that to the exponential power of magic because you've got to have the institutional culture to actually um, work well together. Um, and that involves sometimes taking risks sometimes it involves interdisciplinary collaboration, sometimes it involves letting your defensive down and asking the questions, well, how does that work and how can I participate in something? Um, and I think there's a, there is a culture that pre-existed my time at the University of Illinois where, where collaboration is like breathing. It's, it's more imposed in other institutions where you have to do it, right? You're told to collaborate. At our institution, it's more natural. People do it because they enjoy doing it, and that is a that's a secret sauce right there. That if you've got people who are self-motivated but willing to work across disciplinary lines uh, towards common goals, um, then it's amazing what can happen. I think the leadership, it, you know, is as a servant leadership. Our role is to open doors. Not to not to define who comes through the door in which order. It's to it's to enable opportunities and possibilities, shape them if we can with resources and uh, and stakeholders and partnerships. But the the essential cultural uh, willingness to do things and to set goals and then to buckle down to achieve them is remarkable at this institution. It is remarkable, and it's not as widely known or as appreciated. Even you know, in our own state, as it is in places like India and, and South Korea, so they know what a special place this is. So yes, we, but we decided it was a it was um, it was a shared vision, and there's nothing more powerful than a shared vision. Nothing more powerful than a shared vision. If you can get the buy-in, the ownership, you can set a goal, and the goal was to make it affordable, to really make it affordable, um, to freeze tuition for multiple years so that families were not, with multiple siblings, maybe even middle-class families, would not be discouraged to, um, to attend a world-class state university. And then doing it, and doing it, you know, in ways that are uh, feasible. Um, it, but it builds pride and ownership, it builds camaraderie, it builds that shared vision um, that it's um, you can do remarkable things with a touch of magic. So you're right to use the word magic. And if you think about an exponent in a little equation, right? If that exponent is less than one, you're going down. If they've got the wrong culture, if it's two or four, or you know, you suddenly start to see your impact surge. And I think it's the role of administrators and leaders and faculty and students as well to all be on on board. President Colleen. We thank you for sharing your vision and the vision of the various campuses with us today. I think we all appreciate your comments about what is happening at the flagship universities in the state of Illinois. We wish everyone a healthy and happy holiday season. 
And on behalf of the City Club of Chicago, we will present you with our ah. highly desirable City Club mug. We'll get it to you somehow or other. And also a complimentary one-year membership in the City Club of Chicago. And we look forward to having you and the other chancellors of the various campuses join and talk to us in the future. So President Colleen, on behalf of the City Club of Chicago, thank you very much. One last comment. If anyone would like to donate to the not-for-profit City Club of Chicago, we would be very, very grateful. And if you're a University of Illinois alum and you have a few extra bucks in that savings account or wallet, help us achieve that $3.1 billion capital project as soon as possible. Thank you, everybody. Have a happy holiday season.